Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. So recently I promoted something called the Futo Fellowship Program on this channel, where we pay people to come here to Austin to build their open source software projects. You can work on your own project as long as it fulfills five basic rules. Behind door number one, must be open source. Behind door number two, you cannot have a business model where the user is the product. It can't be something like Google or Facebook where the product is free, but you're abusing the user by constantly mining their data. Rule number three is you need to be able to self-host or self-manage your own instance. This can't be like Arlo or Amazon Ring Doorbell where everything has to get routed through their server to the point where they have the ability to abuse you later on. Fourth is it must support a sovereign identity. And five, above all, it must not suck. So the reason that I'm happy to talk about Alex's project today, his was one of the shining stars in the recent fellowship program, is because I think he did a great job of creating his work. So what he created is a captions program that allows you to view captions for whatever you're playing on your computer. And he's also built something that actually works pretty decently on a phone. The thing I really like about this is it doesn't seem like this actually requires me to connect to some database like at Google, which is something that I went over in a video that I had done. It's really bothersome is while I'm using their system, it literally saves everything without me asking. So 10 years of me using the microphone button on my phone to use voice to text was saved without me saying I wanted it to be saved. I could literally download the audio recordings, search the transcripts of you know me arguing with my girlfriend in 2010, and I thought that was creepy. So thank you very much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. So All right. can you explain a little bit of how this program works, what it is, and uh, what makes it special? Yeah, so I developed this program because, uh, as you may know, some other operating systems have a live caption feature already built in. So for example, uh, Windows 11, Mac OS, uh, stock Android, they tend to have live captions. Uh, but the issue is that, you know, all these are proprietary. You don't know where your data is going. Um, some people with hearing disabilities, they rely on this feature. So it, it should not be that some big tech company is controlling it and has the capability to take it away from them, for example. Uh, so I decided to make it for Linux. It's not just for people with hearing disabilities, you know, with, in, especially in the younger generation, there's people who just prefer watching videos with captions, but not all, the, not all of them have it. You know, if you're in a voice call, there's obviously no captions built into that. So for that kind of use case, you know, this application can be really helpful, uh, I think. And I'm happy to have built this as part of the Fudo Fellowship Program. So what, like in the, one of the things that uh, I, I really liked about this is that it, you know, it, it's, it's actually very accurate. So if I just play my own video over here. Like it, it, this is startlingly accurate, accurate, and it's actually more accurate than some of the, you know, the, the, the actual captions feature on YouTube. What impressed me is that, you know, again, the captions feature on YouTube, which is often very, very far off, is produced by a company that has considerably more resources than like what we gave you over the past three months. So what is this using in order to create these captions? So the model itself, it's based on uh, an Im implementation from the next generation Caldi project. So Caldi is like a speech recognition toolkit, uh, open source project. Caldi's model architecture is a bit outdated. So next generation Caldi is basically like a continuation of that using newer model architectures. So I basically took one of their implementations. Uh, I fine tuned the model for improved accuracy with like punctuation, numbers, that kind of stuff. And uh, that's what it's using. So it's a real time model, so it handles streaming input and has a low latency when it's outputting tokens. Is this connecting to the internet to no. get, get, get this information? So the application right now, so it's a Flatpak application. Flatpak has a sandboxing feature. So each application has like permission controls and it doesn't even have network permission. So there's no way it could, it could even connect to the outer internet. So this has no network permissions. I don't have to let this thing go online and connect to Google. Because yeah. that's the thing that bothered me the most is that like it was connecting to Google. It wasn't connecting to Google server. It's that they, it, they were saving my recordings for 13 years without me ever having hit approve. And like that, and one of the things that bothered me particularly, like with, um, as you said, like a lot of the, you know, Microsoft and Apple have a lot when it comes to accessibility. Linux has, like, let, let's be real, that, that's the, you're lucky if you get a program that works, much less accessibility with a lot, with a lot of the stuff that, we're worried that, uh, that you use. And like with Android, 
you know, I love the voice to text thing on the keyboard. I love the fact that, you know, I can be in my car and I can hit, like, you hit a button on your phone before I start driving and I can type out a six page email by just talking, which is really amazing. It's just, I don't want to send all that to Google servers. And if you don't use Google's keyboard, the Android open source project stock keyboard, it's funny, it actually has the microphone there. The microphone is there, but if you, pr but it doesn't actually work. And, you know, with a lot of these modern phones, I don't think that you need to uh, connect to the internet anymore to send that to somebody else to have it processed. Like you know, when I had a, you know, HTC Incredible back in 2010, the processor probably wasn't good enough to run it locally. But the processor on a lot of modern phones, like you know, the Tensor and the Pixel 6 is more than enough to be able to run something like this locally. Now, how did you get this to work inside of an Android keyboard? When I edit this video, I'm going to include it on the side of the screen so you can actually see. He has a way to, you have a way to run this locally where you just hit the microphone button and it actually listens. Yeah, so I built that like three days ago, like in one night. So it's based on a different model using Whisper. It's an OpenAI like speech recognition model. And it basically runs locally. So I basically exported the model to TensorFlow Lite and I call it with an audio recording and basically just type out the text. So right now it's like a proof of concept, I would say. Uh, I basically forked OpenBoard and like did some very nasty code modifications to <laughs> make it work. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it could definitely be made into like a full Android app. What are the challenges you face in doing this on mobile that are unique? Because w w my question is, why has nobody created this even as a paid app yet? Just so you have an alternative to, to Google's microphone thing. Like, what are the challenges that you faced here that are probably the challenges other people have faced that led them to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not tackling this. Because none of the open source keyboards I can find have a working voice to text function. So honestly, like, I'm not sure why no one else has done it. It could be just that interfacing with the model may be a little complicated because you have to like do an audio recording and do like a Fourier transform, convert it to the exact right format that the model expects. And if you don't do it correctly, the the results are just nonsense. It only took me like a few hours to figure it out, so uh, I'm not sure. What were some of the challenges you faced with getting this model to be as accurate and as useful as it is? Because again, like this has not gotten anything wrong here. I know, like you know, when we originally used this, it got one word wrong on my part, and Harpo was joking that that's you know my, my New York accent, which I don't have an accent. The rest of the world has an accent. I don't know what you're talking about. But like, what were some of the challenges you faced in getting this to be this accurate? Yeah, so training the model like this, it involves a lot of data. In my case, it was like a few thousand hours of data. So just working with that can be a real challenge, you know, having the necessary storage, you know, writing like scripts to transform it into something usable by the training script, and just uh, working with like the next generation Caldi training script. Like they're not very really documented, but I mean, it's not too difficult to figure out, I would say. But, yeah, one other thing, you know, with punctuation, generate the data set, I basically scraped a bunch of online videos, uh, like thousands of hours, and I ran them through OpenAI Whisper Large Model, and that's how I got data with that basically has numbers, punctuation, that kind of stuff. And I had to, like, filter it for, because the Whisper model isn't perfect. It has some issues, so I had to filter out like sentences that had mistakes that didn't have any punctuation. And the reason I'm even training a different model is because Whisper doesn't really do real time that well, like real time speech recognition, where the audio is like streaming into it, basically expects a full audio input at once. Um, so, did we, does yeah. that mean that it stutters if I'm speaking and I'm thinking through my sentence like that, if I have a gap in there, does that confuse it? Uh, what, is the what is the difference between, let's say, it, it listening to a C-SPAN speech or something versus me talking into the phone? Uh, by streaming, I mean like uh, when you're watching a video, right? You're, the audio is like playing in real time. Uh, the app doesn't have access to like the full video's audio. Mm -hmm. So it can only stream into the application. Uh, it basically doesn't have access to look at what's gonna play in like five seconds, only sees like what's played in the last five seconds. Oh, okay, so it has to do, so you mean it has to figure out what it's say being said immediately. It doesn't have time to look, uh, look it up yeah. or think about it. 
Yeah. So that's much. the difficulty. So it's more difficulty to do. It's more difficult to do the real time one because it doesn't have the ability to, like you know, spend five seconds trying to figure out what you mean. Yeah. Because I like I noticed with the with at least with the with the Google voice to text thing every now and then, it it will I'll say something and what it puts there is ridiculous. But then it kind of goes back and tries to figure out what I was saying in context. So you know, for T H E I R versus T H E Y R E, it'll take what I said and then it'll take the future thing and then it'll go back and change the past thing. Like that type of thing is not happening here. Y yeah. So. Um, yeah. So w this has a built-in model, and it says download more models. So like, what model are you using by default when you first open this app? So by default, uh, it's just an English model. The download more models button, it basically links to models for other languages. They're not that good yet. I basically trained them on common voice data. So in common voice, what they've done is basically they take Wikipedia from a certain language and they have people read out like individual sentences from that language, Wikipedia. And they basically publish that as a data set. The issue with that is that it's very kind of a reading voice. It's not like spontaneous speech. So if you train it on that kind of like reading voice and then try to use it on a YouTube video with spontaneous speech, it doesn't work as well because it's like a different distribution of data. It's it's not something that it's seen in ever in training. So, yeah, training different languages is kind of the challenge right now. But I have published some of the models just in case it's useful to anyone just to try out. So if people want to use a different model or experiment, they can use different models. They don't just have to use yours, the one that you provided. Yeah, if, if someone else wants to train a model, like I have provided scripts to export it cool. in the correct format. John says, I refuse to use speech to text because of the fact that everything is recorded. It won't even work if you don't have a data connection so invasive. Well, John, the cool thing about this is that this doesn't need a data connection, and the application itself doesn't even have network permission. So everything that you see here is happening offline. So if I play my video, my web browser has access to the internet over here. But uh, yeah, th so the web browser has access to the internet. But this application is just listening to the audio. There's no connecting to the internet for any of this. It is completely you know, self-managed, which is very, very cool. So m what were the th m major things that you were working on over the past three months? Because you had something that was like, w I, we, we checked out the software during your application, and, and it, it, it actually worked pretty well. So like, what was a lot of the work that you did over the past three months while you were here? Yeah, so the major big thing was training this new model that has punctuation and numbers. You know, in the previous model version, what would happen if you set a number? It would basically spell it out as words, like 130 as words. Uh, this new model, it will actually write the numbers, 130. Punctuation uh, allows it to, like, do capitalization. So, like, as you've seen in... Yeah, I notice here, it's like, it actually has a punctuation on there, like on, at the end of the sentence on require, with you know, the Google voice to text thing, I get punctuation, but I have to actually say, period. You know, Tell me about your day, period. How are you, question mark. And if I say that, it works. So how does this understand punctuation? Is it just the, you, know, you, you train it enough and it kind of knows when a sentence is ended? Yeah, pretty much. Because as you said, this is de dealing with re real-time streaming. It doesn't have access to anything predictive. It's not reading the video file, so it, it doesn't know whether or not like there's going to be a 10 second pause or not when it's putting that period there. So how does it know to put that period there? So the model, if you, uh, if you give it, ju if you just give it enough data, it just learns how a, how a sentence ends, like the tone of voice, that kind of stuff. And yeah, so it just kind of learns with enough data. Now, like how uh, hardware intensive is this if you were to run this on like, uh, you know, let's say a two or four year old Android phone? Because the thing that you showed me, again, while it was quick and dirty, you said you put it together in two hours, uh, since your main project is the desktop application. But like, how, how in CPU intensive is that to run on like a four-year-old cheap smartphone? So I haven't like, measured objectively like, how fast it runs, the Whisper model. But like, on my Samsung Galaxy Note 8, it, like, it worked. Like, it was usable, like the keyboard voice thing. Um, so I think it would definitely be usable um, on a two to four year old smartphone. But 
If it's a budget smartphone, like it could have some issues running that. What are the issue? What are the things that you would have to fix in order to be proud of the Android version? Because like you're very proud of the desktop app, but the Android version, you, as you said, was like quick and dirty, two-hour work. Like what what is the stuff that would needed to be done for that to be proper? Yeah, so it definitely needs some like UI changes. Right now, it's just you click the microphone button, and it's hard coded to just freeze the keyboard, record audio for five seconds, convert it to text, and type it out. So I think it would be better to have like a proper UI. You click on a button, it like shows a microphone that it's recording. Uh, have some kind of rep responsiveness, allow you to, you know, record more than five seconds, cut it early or whatever. And I would also like to make it uh, more integrated into Android. So currently it's just a feature in the keyboard application I forked. Android has some kind of API for speech recognition uh, that applications can use, but I haven't looked into how it works exactly. Uh, but that would be something I should do. Can this run on a Raspberry Pi? Um, I'm not sure. Same. I think it runs out of memory on the one gigabyte model. Kind of curious what it does here. It says four, because this is a Threadripper 2950 from 2018. Okay. It looks like it's using like 61% of one core uh, to get the caption. Yeah, so OBS is what I'm streaming with is taking 207% CPU. Live captions is taking 60%. So is it, would it be safe to say a Raspberry Pi would choke on this badly? Um, if it has enough memory, maybe it could run to some extent. I'm going to play my YouTube video that I did this morning, put chat out of the way, and where did I put my captions? There we go. So as it's making the captions, 68.1% CPU. So it's taking one third the amount of CPU that I'm taking to do this live stream. Uh, to make the caption. So it's, again, like, you know, it's more expensive than having g CPU wise, for sure, than just uploading your audio to Google and having it do it. But, you know, that, that is the cost of freedom, my friends. All right. So well, can people find the Android version of this at the same link that I provided below for the Linux desktop version of this? So it's not really ready, the Android version. I'm going to have to like work on that separately. I'll have a separate repo for it and should be on my profile eventually. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate yeah. it. Amazing piece of software that I most certainly intend to start using as soon as the Android thing. You know, I'm even going to use it even with the Android version being a little dirty. If you are interested in this program, do find the link down below to the Fudo Fellowship program. Again, we pay you to work on your piece of software. We have no ownership over it. We're, we don't have any say over what it is you do. If you have a cool piece of software like this that you think upsets the tech oligopoly, we are interested in paying you to work on it and coming here to do so. And again, basic rules should be open source. The user is not the product that you are serving up to somebody else. Uh, you know, should be able to self-manage, self-host it, sovereign identity. If you have some sort of login system, it shouldn't be some specific server that you have to deal with in order to log in and have your identity. You should be able to do private public key if applicable. Obviously, that doesn't go with this project. And number five, most importantly of all, it cannot suck. It has to work smoothly. That's it for today. And as always, hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.